Hi, here we are. It's Sunday, January 8th, uh, 2006, and we are here at the Lamry Hackett Post 72 of the American Legion at 30 John Street in Sorbonne, New York. And with us today, we have Vincent Mediato. Hi, Vince. Hey, Bill. He's going to share his Marine Corps experiences with us. And uh, present today, we also have me. I'm Bill Payne doing the interview, and we also have Alan Grzynski, who's doing our camera work. So um, thanks for coming, Vince. Uh, tell Pleasure us, to be here. Tell me, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Mm -hmm. And just uh, I went to a one year of engineering at uh, Ulster County, and uh, they were saying that uh, they were starting to pick people that were <laughs> going to start drafting people that were going to school. So I figured, well, if I'm going to go in, I might as well have my choice of things. And a couple of friends that had been in the Marines, so I went down, and they had the best offer. Mm -hmm. What was the offer? They, they, they enlisted you for yeah. four years? <laughs> four years. Uh -huh. And uh, a lot of electronic training that I had already mm -hmm. so I been, you been had involved with. So I figured, well, I'm going to get some more. Mm -hmm. you know? And where were you living at the time? Kingston, New York. Kingston, New York. And do you recall what your first day in service were like when you reported for duty? How was that? What happened? You know, Paris Island. Oh, that was a lot of hollering, yelling, sweating, losing of glasses, all sorts of good things. Fun running around carrying things and uh, 24 hours or maybe 36 hours <laughs> before he ever thought about sleeping for a short period of time until I woke you up at 4 o'clock in the morning, which was a new experience. I was usually coming home at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What did that feel like, that whole? It, it was, um, I had a lot of friends that were Marines. And so I knew what their, you know, what their battle plan was, so to speak. And so if you went in there with the attitude of, of okay, they're going to do this thing, and you just play along with their game, you come out all right, and just don't let it get to you, and you just don't. Uh, it turned out pretty good. You know, they made me a house mouse, and I got a stripe out of it. So <laughs> I can't. I you know, it was it wasn't fun, but it, w it was an experience I wouldn't trade for nothing. The house mouse was a, a, a recruit that became the, uh, the drill instructor's assistant. Right. He carried his coffee uh, mugs for him and yeah. things like that. Did, right. did, mm -hmm. did things. He had a few, mm -hmm. few fringe benefits. And right. fortunately, we 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 had the new barracks, the concrete ones, mm -hmm. but they made you pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> they they made you pay for it. Right. The, the cleanliness was. Mm -hmm. uh, you could run your tongue for one. Place to another, down through the head and back again, and, yeah. and still come up clean. The old wooden barracks, after you clean them, they still look dirty. Dirty, anyway. yeah. yeah. Did and you, uh, you, so you made right the first class out of uh, boot camp. Yeah. That's quite an honor, actually. Yeah. Only about four people in a platoon, of about 60 would make that, correct? Yeah, we, that had we had 100 in our 100 in a platoon. Uh -huh. Yeah, platoon 300. We had 100, at least 100 in there. Yeah, third battalion, right? Yep. Yeah. And uh, do you remember your drill instructors? Yeah, we had a bunch of them. Yeah. One was this short uh, Jonesy. Jones. He drove a, a, a red Austin Healy 3000. Mm -hmm. Oh, short black guy. Mm -hmm. He was mean, nasty, but he was he was good. Mm -hmm. That was the summer of '66, right? Actually, September. So it was it, it was still it was still pretty warm in South Carolina in oh, September. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it never really got. You never woke up and it was chilly, so, so yeah, to speak. Yeah. Remember the other drill instructors? I can't remember their names because we had like, mm -hmm. it seems like every week or so they put another drill instructor in there. And the last one they got with Jonesy, we had him for the last. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but I can't remember the names of, uh, of the other guys because they were there so short mm -hmm. yeah. and, and change around and yeah. back out again. So you got through boot camp okay, which is, uh, and you made PFC, you did more than okay. <coughs> now you served in the Vietnam War, right? Right. Immediately after boot camp, where did you go? They sent me to Camp Lejeune down there, Camp Geiger, mm -hmm. where everybody spent a little, I spent Christmas there, <laughs> where they moved you around from uh, place to place, and uh, they, uh, I guess, I, I think I worked at the PX for a little while, mm -hmm. they, until you're, Troop goes through, they yeah. put you, mm -hmm. and then somebody got me screwed up with somebody else, and I don't know how they could screw up my name with somebody else. I guess it was serial number, not name, mm -hmm. and they sent me over to uh, Force Recon, which was across the street from where I was barracks, mm -hmm. 
You know, those crazy guys are out there doing push-ups off the water, pull-ups off the water tower. Right. And uh, I uh, really didn't uh, enjoy that too much. That wasn't really my bag. Yeah. I was more tech with the tech with the oriented. I really didn't want to go running through the boonies yeah. like the rest of them guys. And finally, after doing a, uh, screwing up a lot so that I would get attention, yeah. somebody finally realized you don't belong here. <laughs> you know, so yeah. it, it was fun. I got to jump out of the airplane, which. I had done some skydiving uh -huh. uh, in St. Thomas, so that's how I got out. I kept on screwing up. And I like skydiving, so was, when I got right to the end, I would unhooked my mm -hmm. static line. Yeah. And finally, after the third time, they, I really got into trouble, so they broke me up. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, somebody with some rank mm -hmm. searched it. And, because you really can't say much when you're a... Uh, you're supposed to be a volunteer for four or three times. Yeah, and uh, so that finally got straightened out. And I got, that's when I got stuck over in PX. Yeah. My my class had already started, so I had to wait for another one to come through. Yeah. So that's why I got stuck there over Christmas. So infantry training at uh, Geiger? Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and uh, what, uh, then you went, uh, what did you go after that? Uh, Memphis, Tennessee for electronic school. Okay. And then... Uh, they, because I, I had actually done all the exact same course. A friend of mine was, uh, he was an engineer for IBM. He was, mm -hmm. he was in the Navy. Yeah. So I had all these books. That's why I learned electronics before I went mm -hmm. when I was in high school. Yeah. So when I got there, all this stuff was mm -hmm. old hat. So yeah. I did so well on their little test that they put me through six weeks instead of six months. Mm -hmm. When I did good on that, they said, "Oh, you can go wherever you want." And so. Yeah. I decided that Pensacola, Florida was a lot more fun than Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So I spent, uh, I think, from May to September or something like that in uh, Pensacola, Florida going to photography school. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Beaches, pictures. So you got a military occupation and specialty of being a photographer, right? Right. But you, you do all this ground photography and then basically what you end up doing is um, I ended up doing aerial photography. Mm -hmm. uh, we had F4 Phantoms, and we had uh, EA6s mm -hmm. and, uh, for the electronic warfare, mm -hmm. and we used to plot film, we used to make maps up, mm -hmm. and have these little lieutenants who thought they knew everything, you know, like commanding, this is where we want you to fly, mm -hmm. and then they come back with their little film, and then I plot the film, and I said, well, you were here, and you were, this is where you were supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. And you went to Cherry Point also, right, Dave Larson? Yeah, that's where I did that. That's where that's I learned. Where that. That's where I actually where you really learned to, to, to plot right. film and stuff like right. that. And, uh, Eventually, you started heading toward Vietnam, right? Yeah, a friend of mine, his wife was to have about to have a baby, and his turn rotation. His his name came up to go because mm -hmm. he, he started. With, his name was Hoffman. He was H. I was I, mm -hmm. and he was going first, and so uh, I switched with him so he could stay home. Mm -hmm. was, was kid was born. So you took this position and went to Vietnam? Yeah. yeah. And I got over there and they... You went to Camp Pendleton first? Yeah, they had a little stop at Camp Pendleton for... Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't too bad because you got to go to Disneyland and yeah, you know, go up and down the coast because you were there for quite a while. Cause they, as usual, Marine Corps stuck you there. Mm -hmm. They had a whole pile of guys and when they needed, when your numbers came up, then they sent you to your little training course and you mm -hmm. just stayed in some... Weird barracks, this barracks, that barracks, mm -hmm. passed you around. Yeah. And uh, then I had another little Oriental stop in Okinawa for, mm -hmm. yes, I was over there for two or three weeks before they. In Okinawa? Yeah. yeah, they get you all lined up and filled with full of shots and mm -hmm. things like that. And then they, uh, nice little trip to Da Nang, you get off the plane, and it's like, you open the door, you get off the 747 and you, or 727, you open the door and you walk out and it's like, wham! You know, 200% humidity and 110 degrees. What time of the day was it when you got there? Uh, about uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Right? Some, somewhere around that time. Time zones were kind of messed up yeah. as you went over, you know. And, but it was, really? it was very warm. Dusty, windy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I think put you in a big old six by and drop you off wherever you're going to mm -hmm. make your stay at. So I got dropped off at uh, Mag 11. Mag 11, not too far from the airstrip uh, no. at uh, Da Nang and pretty close to the airbase. Yeah, you could walk from uh, 
from our from our living quarters. You could you could actually walk down to the flight line if you didn't want to take the truck. It was only maybe you know, three quarters, half a mile, something like that. And then the runway was. They had our Mag 11, then they had the CBs mm -hmm. right on the flight line, yep. and and flight line. And of course, CBs took all the rockets, of course, because when they came out with 327, it was too short. All we got was short rounds in our barracks. Yeah. So that, uh, when the enemy was firing rockets, they were firing from over Hill 327. Yeah. Uh, we called Happy Valley, right. if I remember correctly. Yep. And uh, they were trying to hit the flight line, but uh, when they, they, were, always, they would land in uh, the 122-millimeter rockets, uh, mostly Russian-made, would land yeah. in our living area. Right? Yeah, every once in a while you'd hear a two, uh, 240 come over, yeah. like a freight train. Yeah. <laughs> you could tell when they came over. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I got a tape. Mm -hmm. We were uh, very relaxed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sitting on top of the hut, you know, when yeah. we had the tape, we were making yeah. tapes, yeah. and all of a sudden you could things started coming in. I guess we were too stupid to get off. Mm -hmm. And we just sat up there, watched the rockets come in and, yep. and, and made recordings. You mentioned that you got a piece of, you, you, what was your first uh, rocket attack like? What occurred? Tell me. Uh, all of a sudden, everybody was running and heading for the bunker, which is right outside. This was like your first night in country? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I woke up from the noise of things flying and people hollering at me to get my ass out of bed. And, mm -hmm. and you know, just still not really fully awake. Hadn't gotten to that mode that when that happens, you're already awake. And mm -hmm. uh, you're usually in the bunker before the first one hits the ground with that yeah. little sixth sense that everybody picks up. Yeah. And so I went through a foot locker in the screen door. And one of those short rounds hit. And mm -hmm. this little piece of metal just scratched my foot. That would be a big deal. I found it later. It was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> embedded in the steps going up to the, yeah. to the hut, you st stuck it. Did you, um, you had other uh, uh, rocket attacks, I'm sure, during the whole time you were there. Yeah. That happened every so often, right? Yeah, <laughs> very, quite often. Yeah. And yeah. Most of the times we were fairly lucky because of the, you know, they would use, they used, uh, they dig a, dig a ditch, put two pieces of two by six, basically, or two one by six together, and that's their rocket launchers. Right. So their accuracy was pretty darn good from for their crude little, mm -hmm. yeah. and but because of no matter how how you uh, did that, Hill twenty three twenty seven was just tall enough that the rockets would run over the top of us most of the time, unless they were coming from the south end of the runway, which right. does happen. Right. And, mm -hmm. and they walk them up, they walk they walk them up right to the middle of the. Yeah. Usually they were mortars they walked up to the middle. Right. So. Get mortar attacks also, huh? Yeah. So uh, then what was your regular assignment and duties while you were in Vietnam? What were you doing? Uh, it was called photo briefing. We uh, got requests from uh, intelligence for uh, pictures of mostly Ashaw Valley, Happy Valley, whatever. Mm -hmm. Everybody took Happy Valley because it was our own <laughs> butts that were on the line. Yeah. So even when you came back, you'd open up, start running the cameras and just when they make the pass around, uh, our, you know, when they're approached, they would just do a turn the cameras on and pick up anything, and we'd always go look at it and see see what we we're in for in the night, because you could see them, you know, humping little rockets on their backs and, and so forth, coming around the other side of the mountain. Um, and we, uh, they'd go fly the film or the infrared, whatever, and they bring it back. We'd run it through. We had these big ES-40 vans. They were about uh, probably 25 feet long, eight feet, ten feet wide, put the film in, take it out the other side, it was all developed, and then you'd uh, sit there with your map and look at the <laughs> negative, or basically what we did, we printed it most of the time, and then you'd look at your pictures and look at your maps and say, well, <laughs> this is where you were, you were supposed to be here, or whatever, and then after a while they'd get the hang of it and they'd start getting closer. But so it did base the airstrikes on? From your, uh, your films, right? Yeah, there were uh, Asheville Valley. There was always, you know, they were always looking for um, uh, the damage that they did for the night before and so forth. And uh, uh, when they did fly down through through the valley, a lot of times they would swing up like this because they always had they had tunnels in the sides of the mountains. And that's where they would hide. So they could get a side view. Of <laughs> they could get the tunnels, get yeah. a side view of tunnels yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. We had I even had some pictures of. When they were taking, they were he was they were running about. It was 
when in the winter time you had a, a ceiling of about two thousand feet most of the time. During the monsoon season. Yeah. yeah, and so they were they used to have to fly pretty low, and I had pictures of of um, you could see the shadow of them little goop shooting you up with a rifle. You could see you couldn't see the goop because you were right on top of them, but the, the sun was such you could see the shadow and you could see the rifle and stuff like that. Kind of. That's experienced photo interpretation. Right? Yeah. yeah. It just look for. Yeah. Uh, you could, uh, with the infrared, you could tell when a truck or a group had been there, because even though a, a truck is gone, it leaves a heat imprint in the, in the, in the ground, yeah. and you could see the tailpipe yeah. and the tires and the motor. Wow. Uh, you could see a fire, where a fire had been, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Just, mm -hmm. uh, How'd you stay in touch with your family while you were there? Mostly by letters and then Mars, mm -hmm. two-way radio. Mars is the two-way radio. You could yeah. hook up with a volunteer ham. Uh, right. They had a, uh, you, a place right down from uh, between the flight line and the living quarters. They had the mm -hmm. flight line. Yeah. And there was some, probably some legally blind uh, gook out there that was just supposed to be a sniper, but you'd walk down there and get pock shots at, but they would be like 12, 15 feet away, and he, he must have been, I don't know whether it was, what it was done on purpose, or the guy was just a, such a bad shot from a long distance away, he couldn't hit nothing. But it was kind of entertaining, I guess, after a while. Nobody, nobody in the whole time I was there, nobody even got a close. It was always like, over there by where Al is, or yeah. over yeah. by the wall, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, we talked about this a little before. What was the food like? Well, at first, terrible. But then you got to know the guys in the mess hall and being a photographer I got you know get them take pictures of them with all their grungies on and look like they were uh, mean marines that they could send home and then I started getting good food. <laughs> it's all in who you know. Yeah, right. Used to go to the Air Force mess hall sometimes we talked about that. Oh yeah uh, that, especially before you went home because that's how you start, they had flushies. Toilets, yeah. Yes, and right. so you had to go there for new training uh -huh. before you went home to remember how learn to use how to flush the toilet. Right? Learn how to flush the toilet. Because, uh, in the Marines, we had a different kind of toilet situation. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, ten at a time. Right. Yeah, we had a new. They, we built a new one. From when I got there, there was a four holer, and mm -hmm. when I was there, they built a nice, beautiful ten holer. Yeah. We even had toilet seats, mm -hmm. but which the, was a luxury. Yeah, but they weren't flush toilets. No, they? not exactly. They were burn toilets. Burn toilets. Yeah. Toilet. <laughs> Fifty pound. Fifty-gallon drums cut off. That was mm -hmm. if you were being punished for some <laughs> infraction. Yeah. That was your punishment. That's the yes. Uh, burn them. Burn them. Did you uh, feel pressure or stress while you were there? Well, people shooting at you, and I mean, not near what a guy would be out in the boonies, but uh, compared to staying home or being stationed, yeah, that's kind of pressure. I mean, you know, it's. Uh, even though you had to kind of take a, a light attitude to keep your wits about you, it's still, people are still shooting at you. It's right. not, uh, mm -hmm. when I used to take trips out with, um, uh, uh, nurses mm -hmm. and stuff like that and go just check out what's going on and so yeah. forth. Yeah. See, what's, <laughs> see what the real world is like out there. Yeah. No place I'd really want to be. No. And you could, uh, see how things were going by watching the silver boxes at the end of the runway. Yeah, those are the bodies going back to the yeah. States. Uh, yeah. The morgue was located down there. Right down there. right at the end of the runway, which was another, uh, if you were really, really done something really bad, instead of the brig, they would sit you down to the morgue and uh, wash body parts and put them away. And that was that was the, probably the worst punishment. Yeah. <laughs> You'd rather be in the brig than be down there. Yeah. Is there anything you didn't pickle for good luck? Woke up breathing. <laughs> that, that was pretty much good luck, you know. If I woke up breathing, I felt that was pretty good luck. Yeah. My feet touched the ground, and you know, when I got up, so I, I knew I, I woke up breathing. We how did uh, how did people like entertain themselves that type of thing? Well, we we had a bunch of guys that played. I'm a musician, and we got together and we played for uh, either look, you know, in, in a hut and stuff, or. Mm -hmm. Uh, a couple of times we got a bunch of guys together and played for the whole uh, group or squadron mm -hmm. and so forth like that. Yeah. So you kept your mm -hmm. wits about you like that. And they, the bomb dump went off over there yeah. while we that. were uh, 
while we were there. And then I went to bed about eight o'clock in the morning. I, I worked worked mm -hmm. weird yeah. schedules and and uh, their twelve hour mm -hmm. uh, schedule. And I woke up at noontime by this loud noise of the roof coming off. <laughs> they had a metal hut, metal yeah. roof on the hut, mm -hmm. and the uh, bomb dump got hit and got. They started cooking off. So all of our bombs started to explode. Yeah. Bomb Two thousand pound bombs make a nice noise and they make a nice concussion. I, I got slides. You can actually see the concussion in the air. Yeah. But what was nasty was there was ten thousand pound bombs sitting in there, and mm -hmm. uh, the brave little ordnance guys were in there getting getting those things out. Mm -hmm. They had everybody out and in your bunker, mm -hmm. and the CO came around with uh, cases of uh, liquid refreshments. Mm -hmm. uh, because they didn't know what was going to happen with that until those 10,000 pounders got off because they couldn't. Yeah. You can't exactly take a whole marine air wing mm -hmm. and evacuate it in two seconds. Right. Right. So if one of those 10,000 pounders cooked off as close mm -hmm. as they were, they would have pretty much leveled the yeah. dog patch and everything else that was over there. Dog patch was a little village outside the base where the Vietnamese refugees yep. were. Yeah, where they had tunnels right underneath ours that we found out. And then you found out because they found out actually after I left when they discovered the tunnels underneath yeah. there. Yeah. So it, it, that was not a nice little, I mean, they, they would send a little seven, eight year old kid up to the gate with a couple yeah. of grenades with rubber bands wrapped around them. Yeah. And you're on guard duty, and of course I never had that, thank God I never had that uh, yeah. situation. What are you supposed to do? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, when the bomb up went up, how long did that last? It was days. Yeah, it seemed like forever. Huh? It seemed like forever, yeah. yeah. But it was days because I, and even though it was cooking off, we still had missions to fly. Sure. So we were still, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, when it, when you needed, you went down and went to work. That still. was in the spring, 1969, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. In the summer, yeah, because I got yeah. there after yeah. that happened shortly after. But some of the buildings were still damaged when I got there. There, yeah, a whole mess hall, the whole roof, was, whole roof was gone off the mess yeah. hall. Yeah. And uh, the way it rained down, the way it rained down, it was really. Did you have any casualties in your unit as a result of that or any other activity that would have happened? Uh, some guys got, you know, pieces of flying stuff and mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. Uh, in the group, I think uh, one guy uh, and one of the other squadrons that was in the group got uh, pretty badly hurt down there on the flight line one time. Mm -hmm. Rockets came in, some, some scrap and stuff like that. Yeah. I don't remember anybody actually getting yeah. killed there. Mm -hmm. Other places, I had when I was in uh, uh, staging over there in, in Camp uh, Pendleton. Yeah. Uh, out of the hundred guys that were there, mm -hmm. I can remember um, finding out maybe about forty percent, fifty percent of those guys that I knew of didn't mm -hmm. make it. No, yeah, didn't, didn't come back. Didn't, most of them were. I, I got stuck in with a bunch of grunts, yeah. and so life expectancy was the greatest in the world. Yeah. Did you get uh, entertainers over there at all? Yeah, we got. Yeah, we got we got Bob Hope and, uh -huh. and uh, Ann Margaret. Yeah, yeah. I got some neat pictures of Ann Margaret, but I couldn't find them. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think they were in the the mess of stuff that got. Routed to another place when I sent it home. I yeah. We talked about it. your photographs of cameras. Apparently, some stuff got stolen when we were sending it home. Right? Yeah, I put everything in a box because I, mm -hmm. uh, I, I was in. Uh, I think I was in. I can't remember. But, uh, I was not in Da Nang mm -hmm. when my orders came in to get home, and then they told me uh, package stuff. So I had to yeah. hustle back, mm -hmm. throw everything, and yeah. and ship it out. I couldn't make any plans to. Yeah. Uh, being a photographer, I was allowed mm -hmm. more cameras than most to ship home and stuff like that because it was part of my job. Yeah. And uh, I never saw them again. <laughs> Did you get a chance to go on R&R &R or anything like that? Yeah, I went to uh, went to Tokyo. Mm -hmm. I made visits to Thailand a lot. Oh, yeah. uh, that was uh, Tonsonut Air Force Base oh, there. Rest, rest overnight, I think, it was the cold <coughs> of the air wing, if I remember correctly. Well, we. Our infrared cameras, the Marine Corps, of course, is you know the bottom of the pit of everything that the Navy do, is done with, yeah. and filters down to you know mm -hmm. filter down to us, yeah. and uh, from airplanes to anything. So all our equipment, when we got it, mm -hmm. it, it was in major need of major repair, yeah. Yeah. and so the uh, only place that we could get all that stuff repaired mm -hmm. was over in uh, 
the Air Force. Yeah. They had all the repair vans for our infrared cameras and stuff. Yeah. So we'd stick the cameras in a DC-3 and mm -hmm. make a uh, mini R&R run over to Thailand. Mm -hmm. So I made a few of those. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, did you, uh, did you uh, think of any um, Particularly memorable events, or were there, and also any you Yeah, the day I left. <laughs> day left was, yeah, tell us about the day I left. How was that? That was memorable. Oh, it, it, it yeah. Uh, yeah, that that was that was nice. I, mm -hmm. I, I could do those a couple of times. You know, yeah. could have done those a couple of times. Mm -hmm. But I, it, for compared to uh, our fellow ground pounders, I mean, being in the air wing was not fun, but uh, uh, it it was wasn't anything. I took a lot of trips out there and, and mm. with friends uh, and uh, to drop off. We used to drop off uh, fruit and stuff to the guys out there and stuff. Mm. And, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I felt like lucky. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these guys are lucky. A pair of uh, dry socks is like uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. like getting a uh, ten thousand dollars in Christmas bonus or something. Yeah. It, it was not a very uh, very pleasant place to be. What did you think of your fellow troops and, and officers and like that? They were all pretty good. I mean, yeah. I, I uh, being in photo briefing, I had a lot of contact with officers, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. they uh, were. Before I left, I was. Uh, I used to have them out to the house for barbecues and stuff like that, and they were all. Mm -hmm. uh, they were young kids. I mean, they were. Yeah. They were most of them were younger than I was. Yeah. Uh, about the, they're about the same age. They've gone to college and yeah. <clears throat> was in uh, the uh, in the air wing, and mm -hmm. most of them were, were pretty decent. You get the you, you know you get you always get the 10%. the ten percent that were uh, you could do without. Uh, we had a, a, a master gunnery sergeant that was so gung ho. I don't know. I was glad. I always worked. I always worked at night, so I didn't have to be around. I Man, this is a war zone. Yep. Yeah. And the, the, all this guy was concerned about was polished brass shoes and uh, bald heads, you know. And uh, him and me never really got along too well. But mm. the CO was good. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, and uh, I never really got got into too much trouble that way. Do you remember, you mentioned coming back to the States, and do you remember when your service ended? What was that like when you got out of the Marines? Uh, that was a uh, one-week uh, refreshment party. There was, um, I think, about five brand-new garbage cans, 30-gallon garbage cans, mm -hmm. and about, uh, I don't know how many bottles of Everclear in North Carolina. Everclear is what is mm -hmm. what they what they called uh, pure grain alcohol, which you used to buy yeah. in the ABC stores down there. There was, there was no liquor by the drink in North yeah. Carolina. And uh, plus what everybody brought and poured in. So mm -hmm. it's a wonder the bottoms of those pails didn't get eaten out. Yeah. And that was the last time that I got in that mm -hmm. kind of... Yeah, tell us about uh, how do you feel like your entire uh, military service uh, affected your life and how you feel about your service? I wouldn't, give, I wouldn't have traded it for anything. I mean, and, you know, I got to see places and go places that uh, yeah. you just don't go. <laughs> I mean, how many of my people did I know today, you know, mm -hmm. going to Thailand, back and forth, or Tokyo, mm -hmm. and, and uh, yeah. uh, it was uh, and it's a lot of experiences that you just wouldn't trade for anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, malaria was not something I, that, that I trade, but, you know, the rest of it was pretty good. You got a case of malaria, huh? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. coming back. I guess after about seven or eight years, your blood changes because they wouldn't take blood from me for the first about yeah. seven or eight years after I come back. Every yeah. time I go down and give blood, right. and then you put down that you that mm -hmm. you had that, yeah. they wouldn't they wouldn't give it to you. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't take it from you. Did but, you uh, uh, what did you do in your for a career after what, in the days and weeks? Let's say after you get out, shortly after you get out, what did you do then? Uh, I played kids? Mr. Mom, actually. Really? Yeah. <laughs> my my first uh, daughter was born in October second. Mm -hmm. Uh, she was born October 30th or September 30th, and I got out October 2nd. Uh -huh. And so uh, I couldn't really didn't really find a job that I really liked yet. And I was mm -hmm. taking uh, uh, some advanced electronics right. uh, courses, and uh, so I played Mr. Mom. I ended up 
driving a milk truck for a year. Uh -huh. yeah. Which I got to know a lot of people, and then mm -hmm. I ended up uh, working for National Cash Register for a year, and then right. finally in '73 I had a job at IBM. Mm -hmm. yeah. Until they laid me off in '93. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then what did you do after that? Uh, well, I. Kind of did the same job for less money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the same job for half the price. Mm -hmm. And then in '98, when I lost my eyesight, mm -hmm. um, well, most of it anyway. Yeah. Uh, I just retired and I mm -hmm. uh, restored vintage guitar amplifiers and stuff, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. stayed home. Yeah. And uh, it was it was actually a nice retirement. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that really sucked was not being able to drive, I guess. That's, yeah. that's my biggest gripe. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and now since the, since the back, I can't really do that anymore, mm -hmm. but, uh, mm -hmm. back surgery. So, so now I'm going to get a motor home and travel across the country. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of country to see. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So. Did you, um, you do belong to the American Legion here and recently right. joined up. Yeah. Did you ever have any reunions that you had mentioned uh, to your people? Or? No, or, uh, when you're in the in the uh, air wing, they you, nobody ever came. I was one of the very few ones that usually came back to this. That ended up coming back to the same squadron, yeah. and so the uh, the camaraderie or the really tightness that you would get from mm -hmm. always being in 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 uh, an infantry outfit yeah. Yeah. didn't kind of form. I mean, uh, out of uh, fifteen guys, mm -hmm. you, you were drawing from. Uh, Camp Lejeune, I mean, yeah. from Cherry Point, and you were drawing from El Toro. Yeah. So it was, people would come and go back and forth. When they go over, then they come back and end up in a different yeah. different outfit. I lucked out and mm -hmm. ended up back yeah. on the East Coast. How do you feel like your service and experience affected your life, and is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, it gives you a, a, definitely a perspective on, on on what's going on now, wars and so forth, uh, that uh, a lot of people that hadn't been there uh, should take a, a course on, so to speak, uh, before they open mouth and insert foot. But uh, it, it uh, it's something. I, it's a, it's, a, it's an experience that I'm glad I have because I have a different view on things that are going on and, and so forth and. Uh, what, uh, how things are uh, are done, and why things are done, and so forth, and it, and it just gives you a different, just a different view from people that hadn't been in that kind of experience, and the people that had been in the other Gulf War, they had a different kind of experience than we did. Uh, mm -hmm. They, of course, they, fortunately, they were treated a little better than we were, but uh, it still was. They, they had their they had their Agent Orange over there, uh, and uh, of course the government still doesn't uh, recon doesn't seem to want to recognize all the stuff that was going on, mm -hmm. and the, res the yeah. stuff that resulted. It's uh, 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 our the VA hospitals and stuff like that. My, I have visited some VA hospitals, and I'm really not really happy about what I <laughs> see and hear and. Yeah. Uh, and of course, that's from my viewpoint, and, know, and knowing people that were in there, and, right. uh, I just think we ought to get treated a little bit better for, mm -hmm. for you know, for what we did. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, you, you joined up, you knew where you were going. I mean, yeah. uh, if you joined up in the Marine Corps, your chances of going across the pond were uh, uh, just about the same odds of having to breathe to live. I mean. About 100%. Right? Yeah, yeah, probably about 99.8, you <laughs> yeah, know, and exactly. uh, yeah. so uh, even in, in, in almost every service, your your chances were pretty good. So mm -hmm. you, know, you don't complain about that. I mean, that's something you can't complain about. You sign on the paper, yep. your butt is theirs, mm -hmm. <laughs> and right. so you you do what you're told. Yeah. And uh, if you have problems with it, well, find a way to deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, and it's. It's it's something that uh, yeah it's just nice to see somebody say Semper Fi. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Very good.